Hey there, and welcome to our Sunday morning live stream. It's so great to be together today. All summer long, we've been uh, having these affinity group gatherings at parks and by the lake, um, bringing together our community in person once again, and it's been fantastic. We've had gatherings for young adults, young professionals, young families, and uh, coming up in just a couple of weeks is we're having a 40 plus affinity group gathering. Maybe you're in this age group and you have uh, no kids at home anymore, or you have grandkids, or maybe you're retired or retiring, and you just are looking for an opportunity to connect. Uh, on August 14th at 5.30 p.m. at Kinsman Park, uh, we want you to join us for some long games and some getting together. It's gonna be a great time to connect as a community. So we're really looking forward to that affinity group coming up in a couple weeks. Um, but next Sunday, something very exciting is happening. Um, for the first time this year, we're gonna be transmitting a live broadcast of our Sunday morning gathering as it's happening in the moment. If you haven't been aware, the Sunday morning live stream you're watching is actually a pre-recorded service that we put together and every single week um, to show on Sunday mornings. But uh, starting next Sunday, we're gonna be back to live in the moment. And we're just so excited to, uh, to bring you in for the services that are happening as they're happening here at the house. We cannot wait for next Sunday. Um, and we're just so excited for that. Um, but also, as you're watching this, wherever you're at, I really do believe that God wants to impact your life this morning. We have an amazing time of worship coming up and Ed Weiss is gonna bring a powerful message. So thank you so much for joining us today. I'm gonna to pray as we continue our service and go into a time of worship. Dear God, thank you so much for those who are watching this. It's been a crazy year, but God, we know that you are present and you are close through it all. God, I pray for whoever's watching this, no matter what age or stage or place in their journey with you, God. God, I pray that they would know that you love them, you are for them, you'll never leave them nor forsake them. We love you, Jesus. We're thankful that you're near to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship today. stars they were the morning sun was dead the savior of the world was falling his body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon him
sing hallelujah, and we sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome, and we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, and we sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome, and we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah. Yeah. 
is wind and mercy When all of a sudden Well, good morning, everybody. This morning, uh, I'm going to uh, continue in the series that we're in called The Way of Jesus. Um, I want to uh, take a passage of scripture that, that if you've been in church for any amount of time will be familiar to you. Uh, it's, it's the story of, of Jesus' encounter with the rich young ruler. And I'm hoping that, um, that this talk will be inspirational. I hope that you'll gain some more insights from it and um, that it'll bless you. I wanna start reading from Mark chapter 10, verse 17. The Bible says he was setting out on a journey. That's Jesus was setting out on a journey. And a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, he said, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not um, give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he said to him, teacher, I have kept all of these things from my youth. And I love this verse. And looking at him, Jesus showed love to him and said, 
one thing you lack. Go and sell all that you possess and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But he was deeply dismayed by these words and he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. And I think to understand what is going on here, what Jesus is trying to say here, we need to read this story in the context of what happened right before Jesus encountered this rich young man. Right before he encountered him, Mark records that people were bringing in children to Jesus for him to place his hand on them and to bless them. In fact, um, the, then the disciples were shushing the people away because they thought that, well, this isn't uh, a good use of the, of, the, of the master's time, and Jesus rebuked them for it. In fact, it was Luke who says, uh, gives us an idea of how young these children were. And I think this one little point here really changes that story. Luke calls them, uh, lets us know that they were infants. They were babies that they were bringing to Jesus for him to bless. And Jesus said this, he said, these infants are the ones who most truly show us what it means to be to accept and in, to enter into God's kingdom or God's presence. How is it that a, a, the way a baby and an infant, uh, the way of an infant is the way of the kingdom? There's something about the helplessness of the child. There's something about their complete trust in those who love them and those who care for them which perfectly demonstrates the, the, the humble trust that Jesus weaved into so many of the parables that he weaved into so many of his teachings. Jesus has been trying to, to give the people a picture of God's presence and how it gets into you and transforms you from the inside out. It's, it's, it's like a baby drinking from her mother's milk all the while learning to see and learning to smile by looking at mom's eyes and mom's face. The baby taking all of their cues from, from the face of their mother. And in the same way, is it possible that Jesus is saying that, the, that, that in the same way that a child takes all of its cues from the face of its mother, that we, we take, should be taking all of our mental cues, our our physical cues, our emotional cues, our spiritual cues from the face of one who loves us eternally. The psalm wrote, psalmist wrote this, he said, your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Out of Luke chapter 18, we get a picture of what childlike faith looks like. Childlike faith manifests itself in the acknowledgement of dependence. It manifests itself in, in the humility of a small ego, in the vision of wide-eyed wonder, in the openness of a teachable mind, and in the courage of simple faith, tenacious hope, and tenacious trust. It's interesting that the, 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 the natural human heart is like a mirror. Did you know a mirror in and of itself has no illumination power on its own? Rather, if it's light out, then the mirror is illuminating. If it's dark out, the mirror is dark. And as a mirror has no power of illumination in itself, so the natural human heart only reflects what it's focusing on and what it's feeding on. In so many ways, whether you like it or not, your life is a reflection of the focus of your heart. It is a, a, a mirroring back in your behavior, what your heart, what the affections of your heart are or what the thing your heart is consuming. Science discovered that we have a group of neurons in our brain, in our frontal lobe, that are called mir mirroring neurons. We have another set of neurons up there called motor command neurons. And so when I, when I go to turn this piece of paper, 
uh, what's happening is motor commands are firing in my brain in order for my hand, telling my hand to reach down and turn this piece of paper. Um, there's a subset of those motor command neurons called mirroring neurons, about 20% of them. And mirror, mirroring neurons um, do exactly that. They, 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 they make you, they help you mirror what you are seeing, what you are hearing, and what you, um, what you're envisioning. In fact, while you are watching me and you're watching me turn this piece of paper, your brain is actually internally simulating that same behavior. And because that's what mirroring, mirroring neurons do. It requires imitation, it requires emulation. And that's why when someone smiles at you, instinctively, you smile back. When someone waves at you, instinctively, you wave back. My wife and I were practicing this. We, we would go for a walk most mornings in our neighborhood in Lake Country, and we end up going down this one long road, and uh, there are no sidewalks in Lake Country, and so we're walking on the road, and people are usually very gracious and they'll move over into the middle of the road if they can. And so uh, we will wave at them to say thank you. And 99.9% .9 of the time they will wave back. In fact, not just the driver waves back, but often the person sitting in the passenger seat is waving back. What is going on there? Well, they are mirroring. They don't even realize that's what they're doing. They're mirroring our behavior. It's, it's interesting how you you, you, when you're with someone who's very, very sad, um, you will actually begin to mirror their sadness. Human beings have this incredible capacity to do this. And we learned it at a very young age. I have a, one of my grandsons is just a little over the, older than two years old. Several months ago, I, we were in Calgary. I was playing with him and, uh, and he, he loves, he just loves to make people laugh. And uh, one, one time in the backyard, I, I went, hey, big fella, what are you doing? And the next time uh, he sees me on a, on a FaceTime call, he looks at me, he sees that I'm there, and he goes, hey, big fella. And ever since then, that's what he does every time we get on a call with them. Hey, big fella, what's he doing? He's mirroring me. And that is the way we learn to grow it's the way we learn to mature. It's the way we learn to do things. We do it by mirroring. And mirroring, um, mirroring neurons are a huge part of our spiritual vitality. You know, when we're, when we're singing, when we're worshiping with our songs, what are you doing? You're, t you're looking at the nature of God. You're looking at the person of Christ. You're looking at the face of God when you're, when you're worshiping. And you're, the, the, the songs will eventually work their way back into you so that you begin to actually live them out. It's one of the reasons why God said to Joshua, in Joshua chapter 1, he said, this word of the law, he said, meditate on it day and night, that you might be careful to do everything that is written according to it. What is he doing? He's saying, get this, look into the face of the word, and the face of the word will present itself through your life. He said, but only then will you be strong. Only then will you be courageous. When you are looking into the word of God, you are looking into the face of God. Tozer said this, we, we tend by the secret law of the soul to move towards the mental image of God that we have. And I think he's right. We will become like the mental image of God that we see inside of us, in our minds. It's interesting that Jesus described the presence of God um, and, 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 and the relationship between the Father and us. And he said, it, it, it works like this, abide in me and I'll abide in you. Get into me and I will get into you. And Jesus is offering to, to, to make the rich young ruler in this story one of his disciples. And as such, he, he wants to give him a front row seat as Jesus reveals the Father to the human race. Jesus wanted him, he loved him, he wanted him to be right there, right at the beginning, right at the front. 
And so the young man appears so confident, so well organized, so determined, and yet he looks into the face of love and he turns away sad. And he walks away dismayed. You see, he, he was doing all the right things. But is it possible that the affections of his heart were on something other than the kingdom of God? His life was a mirror of what, what, what held the affections of his heart. It's amazing how easy it is to, to give our hearts to acclaim and achievement and to give our hearts to owning and possessing a lot of stuff. But it doesn't have to define us. And Jesus gave us a clue as to how and what we should let define us. See, God sent his son to this earth with a message, and this is the message. He said, tell them, you are my much loved sons and daughters of God. He came to give that message to the Jewish people and then to the Gentile people and then to the entire world. You are my much loved son and daughter. You are my much loved son and my much loved daughter. And I think one of the enormous spiritual tasks that we have is to claim that truth over our lives and to do that daily. And then to live our lives informed by that truth over us. It becomes our primary orientation point. But it's not very easy to do. And most of us fail at claiming that truth over us on a regular basis. You know, the older I'm getting, I'm 62 now, and the older I get, the more I realize that any one life is but a vapor. It is so short. It is a blink. And yet, one of the lifelong questions we wrestle with, however long or short our lives are, is the simple question of who am I? Who am I? We ask it when we're young. We ask it through, through puberty and adolescence. We ask it when we're starting our careers. We ask it when, when, when our, our grandkids show up. We ask it again and again, who am I? The first answer that many of us have come to is that I am what I do. I am what I do. And this is very real. Uh, this becomes a primary orientation point for so many. I am what I do. But, and and, and if, 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 if I'm doing good and I have a little success, then, then I feel really great about myself. And then others can see what I am doing and then they get to celebrate me and that makes me feel wonderful. But when I do bad and when I fail, it feels intolerable because my self-worth has just been diminished significantly. And then when I can no longer do anymore because I'm old, then I point to my trophy case and I remind myself of all that I did so that I can somehow keep my self-worth intact. And many people live their lives defined by what they do. The second question that we often ask is that maybe I am what people say about me. And this is very, very powerful. This may be the most powerful temptation of all. When, when, when people are saying good things about you, you can walk around quite freely. But when people start saying very bad things about you, all of a sudden your world shrinks and your self-worth becomes uh, less. When, you, when, when, when you're no longer on the right side of the, the pole of popular opinion, you begin to feel shame and anger and fear all at the same time and it makes you live a very small, isolated life. Sticks and stones can break my bones but words can destroy my very soul. And the third way we define who we are 
is that I am what I have. I am what I have. I have a family. I have friends. I have a house. I have some money. I have these things. And in this culture, in this country, we have more things than most. But if we lose any of those things, any of those things, then our worth is in question yet again. We expend an enormous amount of emotional energy protecting who we are when we define ourselves by what we do, what people say, and what we have. And it's an exhausting way to live your life. At the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, he went to the rivers to be baptized by John the Baptist. And when he's in the waters of baptism, it's an incredibly central passage in scripture because it is maybe one of the only times in the New Testament where the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are tangibly present. And the Spirit of God comes and rests on Jesus. And the words of God, the voice of God speaks over him. And he says, you are my much loved son on whom my favor rests. And Jesus held on to those words. He was taken into the wilderness and tempted for 40 days. He held on to those words to be his truth of who he is. He held on to those words when the, the, the people loved him. And he held on to those words when the people hung him on a cross. He held on to those words. Those were the words that he, that he used as a primary orientation point for his identity. And what was spoken over Jesus is spoken over you and is spoken over me. You are the much-loved daughter of God, the much-loved son of God. And our great challenge is to claim that truth over ourselves on a daily basis. And when you define yourself by that, all of a sudden, you live more freely. When you see yourself as a loved, dearly loved child of God, you're not afraid to fail as much and so you can take more risks because your whole worth is not hanging in the balance. The Apostle Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians 3, verses 17 and 18. He said, and we with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. When you are looking into the face of God, you're looking into the face of love. And when you look into the face of love, fear loses its power. When you look into the face of peace, circumstances don't rattle you. And when you look into the face of purity and holiness, moral beauty becomes the fruit of your life. You see, that's what infants intuitively know. And that's what accomplished people find it very, very difficult to understand. And that's what Jesus wanted this rich young man to see. He wanted him to see it. It's what Jesus was showing the young man that he loved. And my call to you today, change the focus of your affections. Change the focus of your, the place you get your worth from and declare over yourself on a daily basis, thank you, Father, that you love me. Thank you, Father, that you, you, you see me as your dearly loved child. And I wanna walk in the freedom of that today. If you change your focus, God will change your heart. Amen. Well, God bless you. I hope that that was encouraging for you and, um, and trusting that you're going to have an awesome week. Thank you.